morning, everybody. How are you doing today? If you have your Bibles, I want you to do me a favor to turn to two passages of Scripture as we get started. Isn't it fun to sometimes see those kids and, and all of the workers that are involved in our, in our children's ministry? Pastor Chaz has done an amazing job of recruiting and developing a team, and that doesn't mean that we have enough. And so if you find yourself with an interest or a desire to serve, we would encourage you to do that. And uh, there's opportunities. You might, you know, we, we, we really want to challenge our church to serve one, sit one. And what does that mean? That means you come a service and you participate in that service just like a normal church member. And then you go serve a service. And that may mean you work with the nursery, you work with the children's, be a greeter, be an usher, work in the parking lot. But if you'll, you'll serve one, sit one, and build that into your routine, you're giving Sunday to the Lord completely and entirely. I want to thank all of my families that do participate. When you see folks in here right now wearing the green shirts, that means they're coming to church and second service, they're going to serve. And so I want to thank you so much. We see them probably because they're a little bit more obvious with the big green LH, uh, white LH on the front of their shirt. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians, this has been our foundational passage of Scripture. You might be visiting with us for the very first time, and, and we've been in this series. If you're a guest or a visitor at Lighthouse Church, we just simply want to welcome you. We want to thank you for being here. You might be joining us. Is this the first time I'm seeing a face right back there? It might be the first time in a Sunday morning. Is this your first time on a Sunday morning with me? Nope. Yep, yep, it is. Wave at me real quick right back there. There he is. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. We're grateful for you to be here. Um, we've been in a series called All the Feels. And what, what, the whole focal point or the whole foundation of this entire series has been our emotions and dealing with our feelings. Our passage of Scripture that we've been using for this entire series, and I hope by now you've gotten to the place where it's pretty close to memorized. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse number 23, this is the foundational verse, and it, it reads like this. It says, Now may the God of peace... Make you holy in every way. That's the desire of my heart. That's the desire of this entire pastoral staff. But more importantly, that's the desire of God. That you would become holy in every way. That your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Turn with me, if you will, now to the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew, chapter 27. And this will be kind of the foundational passage for this morning's series as I set the tone for our final term. Our final lesson. In Matthew chapter 27, we find a very interesting story. Most of us know it. Most of us are aware of it. And as we enter into next month, next month is Easter. And this is kind of like a beginning message, or not necessarily message, but a precursor to all that took place uh, the week of Christ's uh, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. And... What we have in this verse is this is the story, just to set the tone for you for just a minute, it's the, it's the story of Judas experiencing a little bit of guilt and a little bit of shame. It's the, it's the, it's the imagery that we have of what can ultimately take place when guilt and shame and depression move beyond manageable resources in our lives. We read this passage of Scripture, and I want to start reading it to you from the verse up there. It says... Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. Say, filled with remorse. When I look that word remorse up, I, I, I want to stop right there at that word remorse for just a moment. Because when I looked up that word remorse, it says something very interesting to me. It is an individual with deep regret, repentance, penance, guilt, feelings of guilt. Judas is in this spot. He's just sold Jesus. He's just sold out to the Pharisees and the officials. And the Bible says... And Jesus had been condemned to die, and he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. Verse 4. It says, I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. For Judas threw the silver coins down at the temple and went out 
And look at what the result of that guilt, that the, the result of that shame, that result of that remorse, that result of that feeling that he was dealing with on the inside. It took his depression to a level that he says, I can't feel this way anymore. I can't do this anymore. I can't live this way anymore. And what does it say? Those of you that know your Bibles, you've been taught this your whole life, but the Bible says that he hanged himself. Verse 6. The leading priest picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put the money in the temple treasury, they said, since it's payment for murder. Isn't that hypocritical? Wow. After some discussion, they finally decided to buy a potter's field, and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. Verse 8. That is why that field is called the field of blood. The fulfillment of prophecy of Jeremiah that says they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price for which he had valued by the people of Israel, and verse 10, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. Father, I just pray in the next few moments as we share the conclusion of this series, All the Fields, I ask, Lord, that you'd cause my tongue to be that of a ready writer, as it says in your word. Lord, declaring not, Lord, necessarily my intellect, not de declaring my studies, but, but ultimately declaring the word of the Lord. And Father, let there be an anointing upon the word. Because with, with the word, the Bible says, Heavenly Father, it sets the captive free. And so, Father, I pray right now, if anybody under the sound of my voice is dealing with the subject matter of guilt or shame or even depression for that matter, I'm asking right now that the presence of God would be here to set them free at a significant level. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. When I looked at that word remorse, it shook me for just a moment. That word remorse, that feeling of guilt. How many of you have ever felt guilty before? How many of you have ever felt shame before? How many of you have ever walked into a little bit of depression before And this morning, I wanna, I'm not going to spend an incredible or an inordinate amount of time, but I want to set the stage for you. Because emotions always reveal our heart. Your emotions will reveal what's going on in the... You, have, you, have, you ever, have you ever tried to laugh when something wasn't funny? <laughs> your heart doesn't, because you're, you're not in it. Your emotions. But the reality is, is that guilt and shame and depression are very real. This, work, I, this week I was at a pastor's round table and there was a gentleman by the name of Gerald Brooks and he made this statement. He said, we can never place our emotions in the hands of someone else. Do you realize that what Judas was doing at that moment is he was trying to be absolved of the pain and the guilt and the shame of what he, was, what he had done and what he had walked through. He thought that just simply giving the money back would wipe him clean and that's not ultimately how that works. Gerald Brooks went on to say, he said, our emotional health must become a priority. And getting us right is the key to everything else being right in life. Over the course of the last several weeks, we've talked about several subject matters, and this has been the longest series I've done since I've been the pastor of this church, and the reality is I could continue teaching this subject matter. I've had more comments about this series than any other series I've ever done. And the indication of that is it apparently must be hitting home at a very real level. Guilt and shame are real, but we've talked about anger. We've talked about offense. We've talked about fear. Let me ask you the question. Since we've been doing this series, how many of you have been paying attention a little bit more to your emotions over the last several weeks? You kind of you sense, oop, that's an emotion. Oop, that's an emotion. And now whatever the emotion might be. We've investigated and learned several things, and some of these things would be this, and emotions managed properly will propel us forward. Un unmanaged, they cause us to get stuck. Emotions that we manage properly will propel us forward. Emotions can be a gauge of what's going on on the inside of us. We all know that we all deal with emotions. Whether we go to school or go to work, whether we have a disagreement or an argument with our spouse, the reality of emotions is real. But we should never let that emotion become the guide for our life. We've talked about that. The soul is the voice of our emotions. We talked about the soul the very first two, three weeks of this series and how the soul is the, is, is the, is the resting place of our mind and our will and our emotions. 
We get saved and the spirit man is renewed. The flesh is always fighting against God, but it's this soul that plays the ping pong match of what's going on in our life as to whether or not we find victory or walk in defeat. The soul is the voice of our emotions and out of it come all of our issues of life. Our soul can be healthy and our soul can be damaged. We understand that. The manifestation of our soul is our emotions and our feelings. That's what manifests in our lives. And a healthy soul reveals maturity. As I I was trying to to wrap this series up and, and talk about these three things in just a few moments, I realized one thing that as I was studying over the last several weeks, I found a verse that is such an indication as to whether or not my soul is mature or not. Whether or not I'm dealing... How many of you know we can have maturity in some areas, but weakness in other areas and immaturity in other areas? Does that make sense? And the psalmist makes this statement... Because a healthy soul reflects maturity. The psalmist says in Psalm 131, verse number 2, he says, instead I have calmed and quieted myself. How many of you have ever had to do that with your emotions before? How many of you have ever had to quiet your emotions? You've had to calm your emotions. I've, I've quieted myself. I've calmed myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child, my soul within me. What's he saying there? He's saying we can act like children if our soul is not right. You've ever seen a child in a, in a, in a grocery store or at a restaurant just lose their mind? You understand what I'm talking about? That's a soul that is disrupted and they want what they want. They desire what they desire and they're partnering with their flesh. But what he says is he says it's a, a, a quieted soul, a mature soul, a, a calmed soul is a mature soul. Hopefully throughout this series you've learned more about yourself and more about how God wants you to live. Because the word tells us in Romans, it says, For all are led by the Spirit of God, are children of God. And since we are His children, we share in His treasures. Guys, He wants you free. He wants to take the cares of this world. He wants to be your rest in every situation and every circumstance. And the challenge is, is we forget the treasures. We forget the blessings. And the, 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 the requirement of the word is what allows us to mature into the place that our emotions no longer overwhelm us. The very heart of God is that you have what he has. The very treasure of God, the very treasure that he has, everything that is in God is available to you through Jesus Christ. And we struggle sometimes in our emotions. We struggle with anger. We struggle struggle with offense. We struggle with fear. We struggle with shame and guilt. And, and, and we can talk about the, game, the shame and guilt for, in a few moments, but the reality is we all deal with these emotions. We're not undone, folks. We are, we are folks that struggle with these things. And, and, and just like anger, just like uh, uh, offense, just like fear, shame and guilt can be just as toxic. The evidence of our passage where we opened with the book of, with, 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 in the book of Matthew with Judas, the evidence of toxicity, of guilt and shame is death. That's the evidence. And none of us want to die prematurely, amen? Can I get an Amen. So when I, when, I look at, when I look at this subject matter, toxic emotions are the result of, of unprocessed feelings that have been either repressed or ignored. And when we talk about this guilt and shame, guilt and shame often feed each other. The reason I brought them together with depression on the tail end is they tend to play together well. Guilt and shame tend to play together very well. And when we talk about this, this, this toxic toxicity, it's often self-afflicted, it's often self-sustained, and it often creates a self-destruction in our lives. Some, some of you might be dealing with something you feel guilty about from 20 years ago. You're still dealing with it. When it comes to your thoughts, when it comes to your emotions, you feel bad. There might even be a shame that's there. You know, we, we talk about this, this guilt and shame. They create some pretty strong emotions. Let me give you an example of some of them. I'm not worthy and I'm not good enough. 
We start looking down some of these other ones. I'm, I'm hopeless or I'm helpless. I'm a terrible parent. I'm an unworthy son or daughter. I'll never be accepted because of what I've done. I don't belong. People won't accept me. I'm different. Uh, I'll never fit in. I'm unlovable. I'm not smart enough. I'm not athletic enough. I'm not good looking enough. Yes, I am. I believe I am. I'm good looking. I believe that with all my heart. I might be missing some hair, but you know what? I'm stunning. Why are you laughing? Tony, stop laughing. That's right. Thank you for somebody whistling at me. I appreciate that. But you know what? We can get into these places that these emotion, this emotion of guilt and shame can cause us to not say things or we can say things that are contrary to what the Bible says about us. The Bible says you're good looking. The Bible says that you're very rich. The Bible says you're a blessing. But oftentimes we, we allow the guilt and the shame of our past and the guilt and shame of our emotions, the guilt and shame of the mistakes that we've made. Nobody in the room has ever made a mistake. Nobody in the room has ever said, I wish I would have, should have, could have. You understand what I'm talking about? And the reason of that wish I would have, should have, could have is what? That decision I made set forth a, a series of events that I'd rather not talk about. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We go into that place of guilt. We go into that place of shame. And if we're not careful, that guilt and that shame becomes internalized. And when we internalize that, we never begin to step where God wants us to step. When we talk about these unwelcome feelings, if this or that hadn't happened in my life, maybe would people would view me differently. Maybe I could get married again. May, again, may, maybe I could get that job. You know, there's so many things that I, I remember when I lost, a, I lost a job several years ago in 2010. And, and I, I remember the torment in my mind of what could I have done differently? And, and you go into these places, and ultimately it really wasn't even anything I could have fixed. But the challenge is the devil will apply guilt and shame into your life to keep you from what God wants you to do. When we don't deal with guilt and shame, they lead us toward the abandonment of all we've ever dreamed. Guilt and shame will say you can't. Guilt and shame will prevent you. Guilt and shame will, will direct you and guide you around the place that God ultimately wants you to go. Guilt and shame took Judas, one of the twelve, taught in person and personality with the God himself. And he made a decision. Oops, I wish I hadn't done that. It wasn't that simple. How many of you know the difference between an oops and the deep-seated guilt and the deep-seated shame that Judas felt? He, he, wasn't an, he wasn't at this place where he just went, well, missed it that time. That doesn't usually create guilt and shame in us. It's the ones that we internalize. It's the ones we identify with. It's the ones that we begin to own, the ones that we begin to apply and believe in ourselves. And what we see in his life is we see the detachment of relationship. We, found, we find that, that this guilt and shame will decrease our worth and our value. They create negative self-talk. Has anybody ever had self-talk? I went through life coaching in 2015-16. Part of my college degree was leadership. And, and one of the things that, that kills a, a person's forward momentum is oftentimes this thing called negative self-talk. And that negative self-talk will drive you to, it, it, not drive you, it will prevent you from moving forward in certain areas of your life. We create comparison in our lives. You know what eventually happens? Out of our mouth, we say things like this. The guilt and shame is so strong. You know what? I'm probably never going to get married again. You know what? I don't know that my kids will ever come home. We, we, we identify on that job application. And in the, in, in the interview, there's no confidence. There's no assurance that that job is yours. 
We can pretend and we can play, but the reality is this. We can remember the, the mistakes of our youth. And some of you may, may have these more than others, but, 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 but we all have things that we can look back to our past and say, I wish I hadn't done that. It might have been sex, it might have been drugs, it might have been rock and roll. I don't know what it was. But you can look back on that and you can say to yourself, oh man, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done that. And somehow, that instance when you were 14, 15, 16, 17, 21 years old has now guided the direction of everything that you do in life. It affects everything that you are and everything you've become. We consider those past addictions. We consider those past failures. We've all had them, but when they begin to own us as a result of guilt and shame, we can never step into the plan that God has for us. Guilt and shame are both rooted in what should not have occurred as much as what did occur. How many of you know there are some things that, that shouldn't have happened that did? But then there are also some things that should have happened that didn't. That all of a sudden we experience this thing called guilt and shame. Guilt is often this. When we talk about the subject matter of guilt and shame, they often are, like I said, very close sisters. Guilt is the feeling of self-reproach, of having done something that we recognize as wrong or immoral. And it can create the gamut of emotions. When you experience guilt, you can be angry and you can be sad. You can feel trapped. And you can become a victim. When you, when you walk in shame, there's another. It's that painful feeling of something that you've lost. What have you lost? Maybe the respect of others because of an improper behavior. Or maybe a, 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 an incompetence. So we have this sadness and sorrow that sets in. But whether or not we're children or youth. Let me give you some examples of what I was thinking about. As uh, guilt and shame, they, they, they're, they're part of our everyday life. We can have guilt and shame set in from yesterday, or we can have guilt and shame set in from something that happened 20 years ago as a child. Because maybe as a child, we've heard things like this, you should be ashamed of yourself. How many of you have ever heard that as a child? And what we do is we hear that statement, you should be ashamed of yourself, rather than saying, I made a mistake, I'm going to change. What was just attributed to you? Shame. Every time you do something like that, shame. And shame begins to manage. Shame begins to be manifest in our lives. You know what? One of the things that, that, that my kids have told me as an adult, not when they were younger, but as an adult, because I have a great relationship with my kids, that was the number one thing my kids heard in church. You're a pastor's kid. You should be ashamed of yourself. And all of a sudden, there was this, this imagery in their mind, because my dad does that, I can't do this. And then maybe they were, what they were doing was not right. But maybe they couldn't figure out a scripture. And the verse has been asked, and they say, can you quote that scripture? And they say, no, I can't quote that scripture. Well, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're a pastor's kid. Now, all of a sudden, there's this guilt and this shame that attaches itself to every time the kid reads the Bible or doesn't know a verse. Do you see how simply guilt and shame can set in? Now, what about a youth? You might have heard terms like this in your own family. You're never going to amount to anything. Keep looking forward. You might have heard that in your own home. You might have heard that from your parents. You might have heard that from a teacher at school. You're never going to amount to anything. And all of a sudden, the, these emotions of guilt and shame and depression. And so rather than starting a brand new business, when you graduate high school, you go and work for somebody. And you hear the abuse for the next 45 years till you get to retire. Rather than do what's in your heart because it prevents you from doing it. What about adults? I'm just going just gonna to go ahead and pull the Band-Aid, rip it off, because you know what? Some of you didn't succeed in your first marriage for one reason or another, and that's okay. But maybe you heard words like this, you never made me happy anyway. So there's a guilt that sets in. There's a shame that sets in. You never pleased me anyway. As they walked out the door and wiped the dust from their feet. 
But guess what? Going into that next relationship, going into that next place, you're hearing those terminologies in the back of your head and you don't know how to let it go. Can I please this person because I couldn't please the last one? And so there's a natural guilt, there's a natural shame that sets in to this new marriage or this new relationship and regretfully it's hindered before it ever gets a shot at taking off. Guilt and shame is hidden in all kinds of things. At some point, we begin to believe what was said about us. And guilt and shame is deadly and toxic. You know, I was thinking about this, and I know I share this all the time, and it's something I try to do in almost every message. And that is this. It's to give you an understanding that within this book, there are people just like us. Don't you love the fact that when you read the book and you go, wow, they didn't get it. They didn't have it all together either. How many of you can kind of get a personal relate and you just enjoy that just a little bit more as you read your Bible? Because when I read my Bible, I'm going, oh, thank God they screwed up too. You know, when I understand they screwed up too, I'm, I'm in a whole lot better place. And I was thinking to myself as I, I, as I was listening, the, the question I would ask you, as we talk about this guilt and shame, guilt and shame, although it can start from internal, a lot of times it comes externally. It's been a placed or assigned to us by someone or something or some action or some attitude. But the question I would ask you is, who are you listening to? And for the next five or six minutes, I want to give you biblical illustration. And you can write these down. You can put them in your notes. That's okay. But, but I, want to, I want you to understand that that. Guilt and shame has its realities. And, and as I read my Bible this last week, I thought about Adam and Eve. Go to Adam and you can go to Genesis chapter 3. And we're not going to, for the sake of time, go there. I'm just going to tell you these stories quickly because otherwise we won't get through them. But how about Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, the beginning of beginnings. Everything's perfect. Everything's wonderful. Everything's marvelous. And then all of a sudden, guess what happens? Sin enters the world, right? There's a temptation that comes from the snake and the serpent, and they say, oh, that's okay. Don't, if you really do eat it, you'll become like God, and you'll begin to know the difference between good and evil and, and all of these kinds of things. And I'm paraphrasing per Bob. As, as, but I was thinking to myself, when I talk about the realities of guilt and shame, it reveals our exposure. Because what was the very first thing when they recognized what they had done? They found themselves naked. It reveals our exposure. When we come to this place called guilt and shame, it reveals our exposure. It, it reveals what's exposed. And all of a sudden, for, for whatever reason, it, 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 was, it was indicated in their life. The Bible tells us that they created clothing to cover what was exposed. How about David? In Psalm 51, it's probably one of my favorite psalms. When I make a mistake, I'll visit Psalm 51 because in Psalm 51, it talks about the sin of my life. And, and we know David's story. David started well. Man, he rocked it. Took out, the, took, out the, uh, took out the lion, took out the bear, took out Goliath. He becomes king and he's dancing around on the top of his pa uh, palace. And all of a sudden, he's, the Bible says when he's supposed to be doing something else, he happens to be walking around on the palace. He looks out and he sees Bathsheba. And what do we know of the rest of that story? The guilt and the shame. The guilt and the shame. It was a revelation of his sin. Psalm 51 was a, was a declaration by David of Nathan uh, visiting him and saying, hey, there's this guy that created this sin and not just covered it up, but he, but he also had his hus her husband killed. And, and, and all of a sudden, he's like, well, let's do something about that. And, and Nathan looks at me and says, you're the guy. The guilt and shame came over his life. And we read in Psalm 51, the repentance of a man who understands and knows that he recognizes his sin it also recognizes and provides freedom. When we understand this guilt and this, this, this shame that comes in our life, I, I was thinking about the woman who came in, and, and, and the Bible says in the book of Luke chapter 7, it talks about this woman who comes in, and she had lived her life as a prostitute, and, and she, she sold herself, and, 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 and we know a little bit about her background, but, but she comes in amongst the religious leaders 
And that guilt and that shame, she said, I know that there's something that can happen. I can find freedom if I'll get to his feet. And what does the Bible say? She begins to wipe his feet with her tears and the ointment. See, guys, guilt and shame isn't something that you have to stay in or stand in. You can find freedom in the midst of guilt and shame. Can you imagine this poor woman succumbing for the rest of her life to the past sin of what she did? But she, it produced freedom. It provided freedom. How about this? Did you know that guilt and shame will provide a second chance? If you recognize this guilt and shame, I was thinking about Samson. Samson was, he's kind of one of those heroes, you know, when you're a kid, you all, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I'm Samson, you know, you play the strong guy. But how many of you know that the guilt and the shame finally took him to a place where he lost, to, you know, after he lost his eyes, the, the Bible says that he didn't honor his position. He didn't honor the, the, the blessing that was upon his life and it ended up costing him his sight and ended up costing him incredible weakness. But while he was standing in the pillars as the trophy of the Philistines. He said, do me a favor, young man. Do me a favor. Put me between the two significant pillars. And he said to God, he said, God, give me strength one more time. Do you realize that the guilt and the shame had to be real? But he understood at the end of his life his final purpose and his final destiny. We talk about this second chance. We talk about it provides the freedom. But it also reminds us of what's available I was, thinking about, I was thinking about the prodigal son. You may not know this passage, but in Luke chapter 15, it's a young man who goes to his dad with all boldness and brashness and says, Hey, dad, hey, by the way, you're wealthy, I'm out, peace, I'm gone. He said, can I have, half my, can I have my inheritance now? And he says, sure, son, go ahead, take it. And he goes. The Bible says that he squandered it on riches and riotous living. And he goes and spends everything that he has. And he doesn't come to the place of guilt and shame until he's standing in a pig pen, realizing that at my dad's house, I would even have more to eat. The guilt and the shame had to be real, guys. It had to be significant. And that guilt and that shame said, you know what? I believe, I believe this. What's available at my dad's house is far better than where I'm currently at. That guilt and that shame, that moment where he was, he said, you know what, I'm just going to go home. See, oftentimes if we don't recognize where we are, we can't go to where we want to be. How about this? We receive forgiveness. And I'm not going to minister these as much, but in Genesis chapter 50. We think of Joseph's brothers, the guilt and the shame that they must have had when they encountered Joseph standing in the second position of Pharaoh and coming to the reality that, oh, oh, what have we done? And they all of a sudden meet their brother in this position of authority. Can you imagine they found forgiveness rather than the penalty of what they'd done? In the midst of that guilt and the shame, we find also that there's, an, there's, a, there's ramifications of indifference. And the Bible talks about it. Paul writes about it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we find the story of, of Paul writing to the Corinthian church and says, Hey guys, there's a dude in your church. He's having sexual impure relationships with his stepmom. Well, I guess his mother-in-law, or however you say that. And, and, and you guys aren't doing anything about it. Put that guy out so that he might come to the place where that guilt and the shame might transform him to a place of repentance and holiness. All of these different illustrations we understand, but, but the unrelenting attack of guilt and shame will prevent you from walking in and viewing yourself as God created you. When you look at that statement, the unrelenting attack of guilt and shame will prevent you from walking in and viewing yourself as God created you to be. Guilt and shame will keep you from entering into the Holy of Holies. Guilt and shame will cause you to, to come to that place where you say, you know what, God? You know what? I, I, guilt and shame talked about the Israelites when they left Egypt. They said, no, 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 no. We're not going to go up on the mountain. Moses, why don't you go take care of that? There's so many different illustrations that we can find as we, as we understand this subject of remorse. But God can use them for his glory.
Just like Pastor Barry spoke on last week, that there is the emotion of fear, but we do not have to have the spirit of fear. I believe that guilt and shame used for God's glory can have its benefits. You understand what I'm saying? We don't have to look at guilt and shame in, in, in only a negative sense. The guilt and the shame that we have will drive us to positive outcomes because I believe... Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, and, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. Now, is guilt and shame good? No. Is it prosperous and beneficial? No. Is it an emotion that we want to have? No. Just like fear, just like anger, just like offense, we don't want those in our lives, but what can they produce as a healthy, mature believer versus an individual who's unhealthy with a soul that cries out rather than, than, than just is settled? Guilt and shame has incredible value through the truth. Did you know that there's over 200 times in your Bible it talks about guilt? Over 160 times in your Bible it talks about shame. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus chapter 5, there is an introduction of offerings and sacrifices. And one of those offerings and sacrifices is in fact a guilt offering. You have to go back and study that right now uh, yourself because I'm not going to go into that. But I want you to understand a few things as we move along. Do you realize that guilt and shame, that they reveal my failure and my fault? The Bible tells me that I have the ability, when, I, when I'm in a healthy place, when I'm in a good place with God, where the word of God has been set abroad, shed abroad in my heart, where the spirit of God is alive and well, when I have a willingness, as Pastor Barry talked about, by the, by the word of God, the spirit of God, and the men of God, or the people of God that can come and they can partner with you back and forth, we understand that that, that guilt and shame can be a place that we can find our failures and our faults. It will reveal something in us. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 51, it says, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. The second thing I wanted you to understand is this. They reveal that not only they reveal, but they lead me toward repentance and reconciliation. Guilt and shame is the thing that can drive me and move me to a place of reconciliation and repentance. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, Fool, fools make fun of guilt. But the godly acknowledge it and seek reconciliation. Guilt is not necessarily a bad thing in a healthy person. In an unhealthy person, it will drive you to death. In a healthy person, it drives you to repentance. It drives you to the altar. It drives you to reconciliation. It drives you to healing. You might have done something to somebody. Guilt might cause you to pick up the phone and call that person and say, hey, you know what? That conversation we had the other day, it wasn't good and I'm sorry. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, it might pick up the phone and it, between a husband and a wife and it might simply say, babe, you know what? We started our day kind of rough and I'm really sorry. I did not mean to do that. Let me, will, you, will you forgive me? It, it, it might be a response that we have at school. It might be a response that we have in our neighborhood or with our families. I never should have said that. I'm so sorry. Because what does it do? Fools make fun of guilt. Wisdom says this, though, godly acknowledge it, and they seek reconciliation. Number three, they, they function as guardrails in those with a healthy conscience. See, when you're an unhealthy conscience, you don't care, right? Well, you don't care what takes place. You might feel guilty, and you just, you know, the, it's amazing. I was, I was doing a little bit of study in one of my books this week, and did you realize that an individual that does not have a maturity in, their, in the guilt and shame, they move into this place called narcissism, and they call them psychopaths at some point. There's no guilt. There's no shame. They can do bad all day long, but the, I'm talking about in the qualifications and in the, in the center, uh, they become guardrails for those with a healthy conscience. The Bible says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him, for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Isn't that a good verse? You can't go into his presence without the sprinkling of God. You can't go into the presence of God without the blood of Jesus. The Bible tells us in another verse, in Psalms 119, it says this, Help me abandon my shameful ways, for your regulations are good. The last thing I want to share in this regard is this. 
They expose breaks in my relationship. They expose break. They expose breaks in my relationships, hoping to drive us toward restoration. It says no amount of soap. Jeremiah says no amount of soap or lye can make you clean. Isn't that a great verse? Did you even know that it was there? No amount of soap can make you clean. It says, I, 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 I still see the stain of your guilt, the Bible says. The sovereign Lord has spoken. It's, it, you, you can't wash yourself. You can't cover it up enough. You can't throw your coins back at the Pharisees and say it'll just go away. It's only through God that that guilt and that shame can be restored. Do you realize this, that guys, recognition and restoration from our guilt and shame are God's desire. John 1, 9 tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. The Bible says in John three seventeen, it says, For God did not send, us, send his Son into the world to condemn it. See, guilt and shame are the enemy's tools. God uses them for his good, but they're the enemy's tools to keep you in bondage, secluded and segregated from other individuals. But God says, I don't condemn you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you are glad for that verse? There's no condemnation. But what I understand is this. Unresolved guilt and shame, past sin, failures, faults, and unforgiveness can lead us to so many other emotions. And we don't have time for the, I mean, like I said, this series could go on for weeks. And, and some of these will come out as we look at other series and other subject matters. But, but do you realize that, that when we don't pay attention to these emotions, we don't pay attention to these faults and these failures, we don't pay attention to that root of unforgiveness, bitterness can set in. Resentment can set in. Anger can set in. And depression can set in. Every single one of us have dealt with every one of these feelings from time to time and emotion from emotion and all the feels. But these, these, these toxic emotions that we've been talking about for the last several weeks, they can lead us to depression's dead end. When they, when they lead us to this place of, of deadness, this place of there's no other choice but out. Job, in his, in, his, in, his, in his weariness and in, and in his tiredness, made this statement. And my life, as my life now seeps away, depression haunts my days. Imagine the sorrow. Imagine the pain. Imagine the guilt. Imagine the shame. And he makes the statement. He said, depression haunts my days in Job chapter 30, verse number 16. We find out also in Psalms chapter 143, verse number 3. He says, come quickly, Lord. The psalmist writes, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me or I will die. Lord, answer me. See, your, your, your ultimate solution, your ultimate healing is God himself. And in closing, if I could have the worship team go ahead and come up, I want to... I want to finish this sermon out just in the next few minutes. As we close, there's an illustration that I want to give to you. But before I give you that illustration, I want you to hear some things. The undone damage of guilt and shame can lead to depression. As a matter of fact, any emotion that you don't deal with properly can lead you to the place of depression. Why can't I get over this anger? Why can't I get over this fear? Why can't I get over this offense? Why can't I get over this guilt and shame? Why can't I? And, and, and when we get to that place, there's this place called depression. We know, when we no longer pay attention to our feelings and the damage is cause, it's causing to our soul, we develop pathways of depression. Depression is complex. We're not going to be able to get into the subject matter of depression. I'm not a counselor. I'm not licensed in that arena, nor do I ever have a desire to be. Because depression is real. We said this at the very beginning of this entire series. If you need help, you contact a doctor. What this pastoral staff does is we provide spiritual guidance. We say what the Word says. We can't give you the tools necessary that are clinical. Clinical. 
But depression is complex and should never be dealt with lightly. Depression sets in when we won't let go. Say let go. When we won't let go of what we rightly defend, what we rightly de deny, what we rightly claim. You know what? And what I'm saying in, when, when we say when we rightly defend, what I'm saying is this. Pastor Bob, I have a right to feel this way. I have a right to this emotion. I have a right to, to feel the way that I feel. And as a result, when you do that, you just succumb yourself to the depression that can set in. Depression is the result of believing the lies that we tell ourselves and therefore give life to the toxic emotions. But guys, God wants you free. God doesn't want you to carry those cares. He wants them himself. God, God offers rest for the heavy laden and provides hope to the weary. God has taken you. God has taken you, given you your emotions as a voice to prevent depression from ever setting in your life. God has given, put that back up there, please. God has given you your emotions as a voice to prevent depression from settling in. Proverbs 4 tells us to guard our heart. Proverbs 7 tells us to guard by my instructions or the, or the word. Proverbs 14 says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Proverbs 14 says, each heart knows its own bitterness. As I close, I saw an illustration that I thought was absolutely amazing. And it was an instructor. And if I were to hold this water bottle just like this, how much does this bottle weigh? 16 ounces? might weigh, what, a pound or less? I don't know. And just holding it out there is not a big deal, is it? But what if I held that out there for the next 30 minutes? The weight of that bottle now becomes significant. The weight of that bottle becomes heavy, and whether or not, as we close, we're, we're not just talking about guilt and shame anymore. We're talking about the weight of our emotions. See, the weight of our emotions, when I understand for five minutes, it's no big deal. For 30 minutes, it could be, what about an hour or two or 10 years or 20 years? Now, all of a sudden, that, that weight becomes significant, doesn't it? doesn't It doesn't weigh anything right now. But even in the few minutes, the, the two minutes that I've been holding this out there, I can feel my delts starting to scream just a little bit. The problem is, is that when we don't deal with our emotions, it's like the weight standing out at the end of our arm. And, and what I've realized is this. I have a choice. I have a choice with, 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 with this bottle of water. I have two choices. I can either drink it of its contents or I can pour it out. And what God's wanting to say to you, don't, don't drink of the contents of anger. Don't drink of the contents of offense. Don't drink of the contents of guilt and shame. Don't drink of the contents of fear. Don't drink of the contents of bitterness. Whatever the emotion is that's causing the pain, at some point you either, got, you either drink it or let it go. You either got to drink it or let it go. And, and the problem is most of us drink it rather than let it go. Because ultimately the weight of this bottle is not that significant. But multiply it times time. And it becomes extremely heavy. It becomes a burden and creates damage. The longer you hold on to the weight of guilt and shame or any toxic emotion for that matter, the heavier it becomes and the more it creates damage. And for what purpose? Why are you holding on to that anger? Why are you holding on to that offense? Why are you holding on to the guilt and the shame? Why are you holding on to the fear? Why are you holding on to the depression? What is it benefiting you? There's no benefit to it. At some point, 
We have to decide. And Gerald Brooks finished my sermon. I had this sermon finished on Monday. But I told Pastor Candy, I said, there's something I couldn't turn it in to, to, to Tammy to get it done. Because there was something missing. And on Thursday, I found out what was missing. And it's as I close. Emotions are an amazing thing. Pastor Gerald Brooks from Grace Church in Plano, he helped me sum up this entire series in the simplicity of this illustration. What we're going to do with our emotions is one of three things. And those three things, if I summed up all the intellect and all the scriptures and all the words and all of the preaching over the last eight weeks, let me sum it up in three things. Emotions can, number one, go in. And what do I mean by going in? We can internalize our emotions and, and the result will be, we'll burn up. Number two, they can go out. Guess what we do when we vocalize our emotions? We tend to blow up. We tend to blow up situations and circumstances. We blow up relationships and friendships. We blow up stuff when we vocalize our emotions. Ultimately, the last thing that I want every one of you to do is this, go up. Because what we do is when we give our emotions to God, we begin to grow up and we let go of the thing that's been damaging us the pain that's been hurting. Guys, I want you to stand to your feet. Who needs to hand the bottle back to God? Who desires to give the emotion to the one who can really help? If you're in this place, we're gonna close with a song and this is just gonna be a declaration song. It's just it's one of the songs we sang when we started. But guys, last week we had an incredible altar call. Pastor Barry preached a message that drove individuals and I believe brought the, bullet, the bullets home. But I think today, the thing that I want every one of you to decide is I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna give that emotion. You define it, you declare it, you, de you quantify what it is. But I want you to close your eyes. If you're in this place right now, and you say, Pastor Bob, I have a motion that I got to give up. It's a motion I got to drop and let go. And that's you in here. Just raise your hand real quick. Just raise your hand. There's one. There's hands everywhere. Hands everywhere. I'm proud of you. Hands everywhere. You need to make a decision. We're going to sing a song right now. Pastor Dexter is going to dismiss us. If you want to find a place in the altar, that's fine. But before we do that, I got one more question I've got to ask. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus or you've walked away from Jesus. You need a relationship with God. You need a relationship with the one who loves you more than you even love yourself. If you need Jesus in this place, I want you to look at me real quickly and I want you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking around, it's quiet. No, you can make this conversation between you and God. Is there anybody in here that needs Jesus? They just need to simply say, God, forgive me of my sin. I wanna be new. Raise your hand real quick. No embarrassment, no calling out. I'm not doing it won't embarrass you for nothing. All right. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to close this series, as we sing this final song of declaration, Father, I pray for every person in this room. I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that, that the very anointing of God to be able to let go of the emotion, that many people raise their hand and say, God, I just need to let go. Father, they're the ones that have to define that emotion. And Father, I pray right now, God, that you'd bring healing to their souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Dexter. Amen. You declare that you are going to go up. You're going to give it up to God. And I mean, really do that. Let's declare this song together. and sing it like we mean it. Almighty Fortress. 
those who walk in the Spirit, not by the flesh. We thank you for the victory, Lord. We come here with guilt and shame, Lord. We will go out and we leave with victory and confidence in you. Come on, let's give him praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next time.